Welcome to our fourth and final segment of our fall flower festival, guys. I'm so excited. Uh, I hope you hung in there with me all day long. If not, you'll be able to catch the replays on our blog. Um, but just really excited to wrap up today with Allison Ellis. She is offering up invaluable business in insights into the process of pricing weddings with a keen understanding of both artistic excellence and fiscal sensibility, she delves into the balance between materials, artistry, and client expectations. Uh, by factoring in unique demands of fall weddings, such as availability of specific blooms and prevailing trends of the season, as we know, there's a lot of things that are super hot items that are hard to get, uh, Allison gives you the insight you need to price accordingly. So as before, guys, um, in this one, if you are on Instagram, you can stay on Instagram. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter. The sides will be cut off, but we're in the middle, so you're going to be good. Um, and also, just again, a friendly reminder, if you can't stay for the whole thing, we are going to be putting up <clears throat> replays on our blog with a summary and show notes and the whole thing. I now have this cool AI platform that like writes a little summary of the uh video so it's going to be it's going to be awesome the recap so you can check that out also um say hello i see stephanie already i think she's been here for the whole time so i love you girl we're gonna be new besties um so come on in say hello let us know where you're watching from i love to see i one of the i think with gilbert we had someone from spain and we had someone from I can't remember what other country so we we sometimes get people from all over which is really exciting and cool um, a couple more things that I wanted to cover um, before we get started because they're really cool things and I want to make sure everyone knows. Um, I mentioned the design challenge, so I won't go over that again. But yes, we have a cool design challenge that has a prize of um, someone going to Ecuador, which is really cool. So you're going to want to participate in that. Um, also wanted to see if anyone is watching or you know anyone. Um, we're looking for new Mayish design stars, guys. So uh, we're accepting applications until the end of September. It's coming up really quickly because, it, gosh, it's already August 22nd. I can't even believe it. So, yeah, fall is coming, guys. Um, so we need, we need those applications. We're looking for really great people. I'm really excited. Um, and, again, we have our workshop. So we have um, three more cities I think we're hitting up at the end of the year. The, like late fall, early winter. And uh, that's that's it. That's all I wanted to cover really quickly before I bring on our amazing Allison. Allison, how are you? Hi, I'm great. Thank you for having me. I've been tuning in all day. It's been really fun to listen you? in. Props, props on being a great host. Oh, thank you. And you have been tuning in the whole time, which I love. Thank you so much for your support because I, that is not something that you had to do. And I just, I appreciate having someone like you want to watch with and hang out with me all day. So thank you. I was hanging out with you while I was hanging out my laundry, actually. I could bring <laughs> the beauty, right, of being able to watch YouTube on the phone. Yes. As I a little bit it. country and a little bit tech all at once. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, we have other people here. We have Scott from Pittsburgh. Hey, Scott. Um, we have Gail. She's been enjoying the whole thing, too. Hi, uh, Laura from Blooms and Sweets. We have uh, Gladrich. I think I'm saying that right. From Port Charlotte, Florida. Uh, so you're in Florida. So am I. And uh, we have Edna from Design Studio so far mm -hmm. that are brave enough to say hello. So hi, guys. <laughs> yeah, thanks for tuning in. And Allison, before we get started, because I was just saying, like, we haven't really talked in a while. So I want to make sure everyone knows who you are. And I want people to hear a little bit about your flower story. Yeah, it has been a while, but we always manage to get a pricing chat in like at least once a year, I think. Yes, We're, we I'm do. proud of us. Yes. Um, so thanks for having me back again. Yeah, I'm Allison Ellis. I am a floral designer in Vermont. That's the little bit country part. Um, <laughs> and I've been running my home studio floral design business where I focus on weddings for 22 years now. So 
That's amazing. Is, Congrats. Well, 22 wedding seasons. <laughs> 21 years, 22 seasons. And I still really love, love, love my business. Um, I love weddings. I love my customers. I love my schedule and my life that I'm able to create around my business um, and because of my business. So yeah, I am a, what I call a floralpreneur <laughs> because I really focus on the business side of my business. And about eight years ago, I started teaching floral designers how to price for profit following the really simple industry formulas that I learned in flower shops in a course I created called Flower Math. And then I just realized I had other things to share. So I have all kinds of courses now on things like pricing, client communication, marketing, and all kinds of stuff. And I have on my blog today, like a fresh link of what I'm teaching for the rest of the year, <laughs> yes. starting tomorrow with something in September. So there's something, several things for the rest of the year. So if anyone wants to hop into one of those um, trainings, some of them are free, some of them are paid, like tomorrow is a $5 starting price, pay whatever you want for my business plan refresh, I try to make it really accessible education. It's not only like high ticket kind of, um, you know, prices. Right. And that's one of the reasons, you know, obviously we've been kind of partnering for a while now. I'd have to go back into like the archives to see like, <laughs> when was first the first chat. time we chatted live? I don't know. Um, but you do make it a, I can't speak now because, you know, I'm on my fourth one. We can even say just say it for affordable. Me. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Accessible. Accessible? Accessible. Yes. That's the way I should say it. Yeah. Yes. See, everyone's like, you're such great. You're great at speaking. I'm like, I still stutter and I have a hard time saying certain words, especially when my brain is tired. <laughs> yeah, we're all human. We all miss it sometimes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I was like, if I can do this live, you guys can go live too. I promise. Okay. Enough about that. Sorry. <laughs> no, you know, I love the, when you encourage people to get on camera and just do it because it is yeah. something that I admire about you and I, I preach as well. Yeah. Yeah. You just got to do it. And it's really just a great way to kind of talk and engage and, um, you know, and just share your knowledge, which helps, you know, create that whole, you know, being an expert and people and building trust and, yeah, we could do a whole session on that if we wanted to, but we're let's here to talk about now. pricing. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get started on pricing. So Allison, can you explain your pricing process to ensure that each and every wedding and event that people are doing are actually profitable? Because that we're in a business, right? It's fun to be artistic and it's amazing to get involved with all of these events and creating beautiful weddings and moments and things. And you want to give everyone everything. But at the end of the day, if you're not profitable, you're not going to get to do what you want to do. Yes. Yes. I don't think I need to say anything else. I think you said it. that's it. <laughs> if we if we are not focused on the profit margin in our business, then you might be having more of a hobby than a business, right? And that's what we want to distinguish. Do we do flowers because it's fun? Or is this actually how we want to pay ourselves, feed our families, um, maybe retire one day, right? So focusing on the profit margin is always the thing that I am encouraging florists to do because We'll talk about pricing because that's why I'm here. <laughs> but the profitability piece is the most important thing because you can mark up, you know, people will say, well, you should mark up your flowers three times. You should mark up your flowers four times. Right. You should mark up your flowers five times, right? Whether you mark them up three times or five times doesn't matter if you're over buying and not making money. So a florist who might say, um, you know, not that any florists are ever snarky in Facebook groups or, or anything like that. Oh, never, <laughs> never. Everyone's always so sweet and supportive all the time. If they were, though, they might say something like, well, right, just offhanded. You should be marking up your flowers at least four times. You should be marking up your flowers three times. You should, whatever it is. 
you don't just because someone's marking their flowers up more doesn't actually mean they're making more money. So that's what I always like to make sure we're focused on. I don't care about how much you sold. I care about how much you kept. So that's what it really comes down to. Sometimes we are looking outward and seeing other people doing this thing or following blind advice like, oh, well, it's four times. I'll just do that without really understanding how we layer our pricing. So the way that I price, whether it's a wedding or a daily order, when I used to do like my weekly accounts, is pretty much the same. I'm going to take my flowers and I'm going to mark them up between three to four times as the average. People who mark them up five times are marking them up more than the average. Doesn't make it wrong. It's just more than the average. You can always go to three and a half, right? Cut it cut it down the middle there and do three and a half times markup. Right. Whatever you choose for your markup, that's like the price per stem. That's your bucket price is how I look at that. And then there's a fee for me to design it. If I am putting it in a vase, if I am using my expertise, I have been a floral designer for 30 years, right? If I am using my 30 years of experience to create this arrangement, that goes in to the price as well. And that's my what I call my design fee. Some people call it labor, whatever you call it. It's for your time. <laughs> it's for your time to design yeah. or your designers to design. And then, of course, we're charging for the container. We're charging for delivery. So at the end of the day, you can charge through the wazoo. But how much are you spending is what it's always going to come down to when we're really talking about profitability. So it's important to know the markups, but it's really important to track your profit margin. And that's my answer to the question, how do I ensure that I'm profitable? I track that on every single wedding. That's very good. So there's a lot that goes into that. <laughs> Okay, so I ha I think I have this little scenario here. Okay, so we we did the pricing, we set the we sent in the order, we put a I don't know, this is about sub. Sorry, 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 sorry. So, okay. So how how do people make sure that they're not overbuying? Okay. So, I I'm going to do uh, I mentioned this to you in our little pre pre chat, but I'm going right. to be doing a longer, like an hour long pricing chat in September, where I'm going to really dive into this three numbers florists need to know in their business. Um, but what I'm focused on when I am teaching that session or when I am doing my own buying is I, you don't have to have a spending goal when you make a sale. So we don't have to spend 30%. That's what a lot of florists will say to me. Well, I just make sure that I spend 30% and then I know I'm good, right? Right. <laughs> However, if you're actually following the standard pricing model, so I say that it's easy to go, oh, push back, oh, standard. But there's nothing standard about my work. I don't follow, right? You're better than the standard. It's easy to say things like that, little catchphrases. Well, the industry standards, outdated, or things like this. <laughs> Show me your receipts and how much you profited this year. <laughs> and then I will listen to little, little tales, little, you know, sound bites with nothing behind them to justify any kind of other pricing structure that exists. There is an industry standard. There are variables within that standard. It's not there's one markup, one design. That's it's not that kind of standard. That's like price fixing. <laughs> That's a little different. But there are some general ranges of how we're marking things up. And if you are following that and then buying in a way that is smart, where you're not overbuying. So what do I mean by that? When I go to place an order, if I have 23 extra Moab roses, maybe 
I don't need one bunch of those roses. Maybe I should order one fewer bunch because I've got 23 extras of these. And maybe I've got two extra Snapdragons somewhere else that'll make up for those two stems out of 25 that I was going to order 25 stems for. So it's paying attention is what it is. It's paying attention to how much you're ordering to make sure you actually need it. Following recipes for everything I make. That's another thing where people like to kind of throw, oh, I can't, I'm too creative to follow a recipe, right? The most creative florists that you follow on Instagram, follow recipes, even if once they're in the studio, they adjust the recipe, there's some kind of actual pricing formula that they're following, if they're profitable, <laughs> that allows them to know how much to order and to make sure that they are not over ordering. Because when we are just buying based on our gut, that's when we're overfilling, we're just buying because we love it, we're adding an extra bunch here. And that's where that profit margin goes down. So when someone focuses on their spending goal, well, if I have this much money, if I have a thousand dollar order, right? Well, then I'm going to spend $300. That doesn't actually work because what if you followed recipes and ordered smartly, like the way I teach to do it in flower math. What if you did that? And then you actually had a 74% profit margin, or sometimes I have a 78% profit margin. If I'm doing a lot of rentals, sometimes I have an 81% profit margin. So why would I spend more money when I could be keeping more of the money I'm already making? Right. Well, I love that. And Back in the day, like way back in the day, I did do a few wedding seasons and um, that was before kids and everything, guys. So I was like a young chicken, <laughs> <laughs> but I was a nerd. So, you know, I'm an analyst at heart and I had my little spreadsheet and I had my recipes because I never could wrap my brain around like, I'm just going to go in and wing it and buy what I feel and then make the things. I was like, I don't know how people do that. <laughs> my brain does not work that way. Um, but like, I always knew how much um, I was making and I always knew how much I had to buy. And then you were ta talking about paying attention to extras. So like, if I knew I needed, you know, X, Y, and Z items and, and you know, the bride really wanted this one item, I would figure out like how like to work it into the other things if I needed to and not buy something else then. So, you know, just kind of, again, being smart because, you know, I was also kind of a, a studio kind of person and I didn't want any extras. I wanted zero extras at the end of the day, you know? Yes. So how do you do that? <laughs> yes, exactly. And, you know, I see a comment, yes, amen to recipes. For anyone who's like, oh, you know, resistant to the recipe thing, here's the deal. It's just like how it's done, you know? <laughs> it's like, it's just, it's the way, this is the way. Because when we know how much each arrangement needs, and when we know how much money we have, and we know how much money we're making, then, for example, I might look at a wedding where I have an 81% profit margin and go, you know what? I could add another white spray rose to each of those centerpieces. It wouldn't kill me. I'm going to head to my wholesaler and see what they've got, right? Like, it doesn't have to be that, um, you know, it helps to inform whether something is full enough, right? Did I make enough money off of this where I can actually say, oh, so here's a, just a real life example. So um, every now and again, it's going to sound crazy, but... I screw up and I forget to order something or like I order the wrong quantity or something. And I don't know. I don't know how it happens. Every time I'm like, this is impossible. Impossible. That never happens to anyone ever. Impossible. But somehow. So, for example, it happened recently with a wedding that was a small wedding. It was a pickup wedding. Sorry. It wasn't a pickup wedding. It was a like personals only no centerpieces wedding. And which I don't do a lot of, but I really liked the customer. 
And I should have ordered five bunches of white stock, but for some reason I ordered one. So <laughs> I had to change my recipes around. I came out to my garden, I cut some flocks. Um, but when it came down, when push came to shove and I got to the profit margin and I saw everything, I went, you know, for the amount of time I spent and for what this is, they're full enough. This is good. I didn't go, oh no, I better go and get the, that stock because I owe it to her, right? right? Because I owe her a spending amount in order for it to justify my price. No, right? I, I don't have to spend a certain amount of money to justify charging a certain amount of money, but I do want to make sure that I'm following my pricing formulas where I'm pricing up my flowers three to four times. I tend to stick with three times, frankly. Um, adding my design fee of 30 to 40% to everything that I'm making um, the more complex, I might add a higher design fee, but I am not going in to my wedding season going, I know how much I'm going to make because I know I'm spending 30%. Right. It's, it's always a goal to make as much as possible. Maximizing that margin is the goal because if I don't spend it, I get to keep it. And then that becomes my money that I can spend on my family or reinvest in my business. Right. Yeah, that's very good. But still kind of you balancing, you know, what the customers are expecting and what they're and making them happy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a great question from Abby. She asks, what about when you're trying to work from your garden? You brought up your garden, like you went out and cut some flocks. Uh, how would you plan for that slash plan for last minute buying? I'm finding that to be difficult. Um, so maybe I would have a follow-up question of like, are you finding it difficult to predict what you're going to have in your garden or so for example, for me, especially this year, gosh, it's been so wet here in Vermont, but sometimes like things come early. Sometimes they come late. <laughs> Peonies right. were late this year or they didn't come at all because we had a frost, right? So in that kind of a case, when you're pricing something, for example, if you're a flower farmer and you're pricing a bouquet that includes peonies that you plan to grow, you should still price it as though you need to buy those peonies because what if you have a frost like we had um, in very late May that just plain old, they didn't even have buds on them. There's nothing. So you still have to fill that order. Should you now be like losing money or should you be now having to come to your client and explain a whole deal. No, you could just easily make the sub, right? Because we want to talk about how do we make those substitutions. We want to be able to easily make that sub of somebody else's peony <laughs> for your peony and you're not losing money. So I'm always thinking in retail dollars about what would I charge for a peony, not what would I pay for it. Um, if it's like, well, maybe I actually have something in my garden and I'd rather use that, that comes down to relationship with your wholesaler. Can you order something and then cancel it? Is it not a big deal? Um, with my supplier, for the most part, unless I'm ordering something special, it's not a big deal if I get there and I decide I want a, I want the, you know, white lysianthus with that lavender little kiss around the tip versus just the white that I ordered, right? He's not going to say, nope, you ordered this white. <laughs> it's yours. Right, so right. if you can have the ability to cancel something, if you don't need it, if it's not a problem, that could be one way to navigate it. But it's about having a good relationship with your supplier. And then also, you know, knowing the value of your time as you're cutting and processing flowers from your own garden. Very good. Very good. So you, you talked a little bit about subs and this is where my little, okay, so you did the pricing, you put in the order and, but a box of very important flowers are confiscated by customs because that happens. Mm. <laughs> they found like one little thing and now they took the whole box and who knows what happens to it. And now we have to make subs. So how, how should people handle that kind of situation too? And again, remain on in budget and profitable. So 
One of the things I like to do is, well, first of all, I'm using an app that's really helpful to me, the Every Stem app. I don't know if you're familiar with it, no. but it's really helpful. It's it's not client facing. It's just for putting together the wholesale orders and the recipes. So I can see before I place my order where my profit margin is at. And what I always like to do is build in a buffer. So I'm not ordering 30% of my sale. I'm ordering less than that so that when I get to my supplier, when they have smoke bush, I went and cut some smoke bush from my garden during one of your, during the noontime <laughs> tour. Um, but so like when there's something beautiful that's in the palette and it's perfect, like the like kind of mustardy terracotta zinnias that he had a couple weeks ago. I don't have to go, oh, what do I have to give up? Or, oh, I wish I could afford these. I can use them. And when he says, oh, you know, that white stock isn't coming in until tomorrow, you could come back tomorrow. I can say, well, what else could I use instead of that white stock? So for example, what do I need it for? So these are, this is how I'm thinking about substitutions. Do I need it for the color? Do I need it for the shape? Do I need it for the texture? Like what kind of work is this flower doing? So what then can I sub it for? So this is where I'm going to look at my sheet now and go, okay, so where is that stock? Oh, it's mostly in the centerpieces. Oh, there's one per centerpiece or whatever. You start to realize that's pretty easy to just kind of sub with something else. Right. So depending on how flexible your customer is, which I always want them, I like them to be like Gumby. You know, I want to be as flexible as possible when it comes to flower choices. Then it comes down to just, is this a similar price? So if my five stock didn't come in, but I buy five Lysianthus, it might not quite work out budget-wise because I'm ordering something that probably costs more. But maybe if I if I know what I'm actually trying to sub and why, that one bunch of Lysianthus serves as three bunches of stock or something like that, because I just need it for the touch of white or whatever it is. Um, so having an understanding of really like your why <laughs> behind what you're designing, which is also why the recipe comes in handy, because I know I don't have enough white for those centerpieces. Oh, but you know what? That doesn't really matter anymore because we actually are doing multicolor. So a little bit of white doesn't matter. Or, right. oh no, I really needed those green hydrangea. I have three per centerpiece. It's a different level of urgency. And again, consideration of what do you need it for? Are you replacing the shape, the size, the color, the texture, and then keeping an eye on the price to make sure you're not subbing with something that is like a tremendous upgrade from what you had originally planned. Right, right, right. And Allison, how do you handle things that like, you know, for example, like a fall wedding, but you might have, you know, put your proposal in or the quote and you did your pricing like way far in advance and, you know, the Moab roses, I don't know how much they are, but they looked like they were an expensive rose, you know, you might not know that maybe they're like a dollar more or whatever. Like how, how do you plan for some things? Like, you know, that they're probably going to be expensive. You might have an idea, but maybe you weren't right on the money. So how do you plan for things like that and kind of hedge your bets on that type of stuff? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good question. You know, I think I want to know what it costs. So I would be asking some questions and I also, again, I'm always thinking in retail dollars. So whether I was already planning that that rose was going to be $5 or $6, if it really should be $7, at the end of the day, unless I've got, you know, thousands of them, hundreds and hundreds of them in my event, one small miscalculation on one type of flower like that isn't going to actually make that big of a dent in the overall event. Like, especially if we're talking about, even if it's 50 or a hundred roses, you're talking right. about if I should have charged a dollar more, let's just say per rose times a hundred roses, that's a hundred dollars retail, right. which means 
you know, I, now I'm dividing that by three or four, depending on what your markup is. It's a, it's a really little amount of money, even if it's, let's say it was $40 that I should have made. Okay. Um, it's not going to break the bank for me and I'll learn the lesson and I'll know next time. That's good because I do feel like sometimes people freak out, like, you know, and that they need to know the exact price. And sometimes, you know, that isn't possible. So mm -hmm. we're like, we can look at history. We can look at those types of things, but that's a really great point just to be like, when you look at the grand scheme of it and how much it actually is, it's not, yeah, it shouldn't be breaking the bank if you did your flower math properly. Exactly. Like, do I still wish I had made that $40? Sure. Am I <laughs> cheap like that? I'm cheap like that. But, um, but again, yeah, I, you want to know the level of damage, right? Maybe, <laughs> maybe if those roses were a little more expensive, maybe I don't get this other thing that I really, really wanted, but I just can't afford it. You know, we can't always be shopping with our eyes and our guts. And if you are like, what do you mean? That's the only way to shop. Then you have to be really clear on how much heart and gut you have to spend. <laughs> Can right. you spend $50? Can you spend $100? I'll say this. That's a lot of extra money to spend. I actually went for my last wedding. It was lots of colors. Super great client. Super nonspecific. Super rainy summer super predicted to be rainy on her wedding day, which I know likey. And I really bought some extra things. These zinnias were pretty special. Like I, and I got back and I went, oh my gosh, did I do something wrong here? And I didn't. When I did my math, I was at my like 74% or whatever it was. But that's because, not because of luck, <laughs> it's because of skill, right? It's because I made sure when I bought that I left room for that kind of, you know, impulse buying. Right. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. But I still panicked that I overspent a little bit, felt that shamey feeling of like, oh, you teach people, you know better. Then I did the numbers and redeemed myself, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not... And the reason I say that is just because it's not some ubiquitous feeling of like, oh, I overspent. It's like, did you or didn't you do the math and find out? And then you don't have to beat up on yourself for no reason. Yeah, very good. So when figuring out, we, we talked about subs and things like that, but also when you're figuring out recipes, right? That's very exact, but things do come in bad. Things get broken. Like, do you recommend padding the order to cover possible flower stem issues? You know, I don't partially because I always like to keep track of how many extras I have. That's also probably why I really love the Every Stem app is because it tells you how many extras. So again, like that example from before, if I see that I have 23 extra Moab roses, I can go alert, alert. That's an entire extra bunch of roses that you are buying right now <laughs> that you do not need, right? Right. So I can choose to buy them because I go, oh, you know what? But I would like to add an extra here or there because I left room in the centerpiece, for example. Mm -hmm. I left $10 per centerpiece that I can fill. I can use one of those roses. Right? If there's a place where I can use it, great. But if not, I'd rather be two roses short than 23 roses over any day of the week because I can... I can make something out of nothing, right? Like, I mean, seriously, I like, it doesn't take much to make a beautiful arrangement. We can sometimes forget how beautiful flowers really are when you work with them so much. It sounds crazy, but it's true. Right. It's like when someone walks in your flower shop and goes, it smells so good in here. And you're like, what are you even talking about? I smell <laughs> nothing, you know? Right. I always laugh when people walk into coolers and they're like, oh, it smells great. And I was like, oh, I don't like it, the smell. <laughs> like, yeah. But like you go home, you yeah. smell like flowers. You don't even know it, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> but we become blind to certain things and we think, oh, well, I owe them a certain amount of stems. So if I lost, you know, a, a hydrangea or 
Sometimes, you know, there's a rose with a broken head. I'm not like, oh no, if I don't have the exact right stem count, I'm toast. Right. I can make it work. And especially if I know I've got, you know, five extra stock here or nine of this or whatever. Every now and again, if I'm like really tight, because I am, I, my motto is keep your wholesale orders tight and right. If I'm really tight, then sometimes I might just order one extra bunch of something just because I don't have any extras like anywhere. Right. That's a good point. And what are your thoughts about minimums? Should florists set minimums for their weddings, do you think? Oh, gosh. The easy, very simple answer is yes. Uh, But the real answer is yes and or yes but. Because it depends on who your customers are, what your business structure is, and like what your ultimate goals are. So basically, yes, I want to have a minimum before I'm going out the door on anything, whether it is a daily delivery or a wedding. I want to know what's my minimum for delivery on this event. What's the minimum, like your get out of bed fee, just to get me to come into the shop today, just to get me to give you uh, the the weekend, right? I'm giving you my Wednesday through Saturday for most of my events. So what does it cost to have me for this period of time for this specific event? So I mentioned earlier that I did a, um, like a boot personal bouquets and ceremony flowers only. They did not want to do centerpieces. It's a really big wedding and they just, they just didn't have it. Okay. (laughs) They just didn't have it. Right. But for what they wanted, it was a fine budget. It was a great client and it was easy. So for them, the minimum was based on what they wanted and their expectations And the fact that I was like, yeah, heck, I'm not doing, this will be the only weekend I'm working in July. I love the idea of not having to make 25 centerpieces (laughs) and still making, uh, you know, whatever, I think it was probably $2,500 off of their wedding. Right. Okay. So (laughs) we don't want to be stupid where we go, oh, I have a minimum of $5,000 when you could be making $2,300 doing something little and easy. So what do you want out of your business before you're setting a minimum? How you communicate it is a whole deal. Right. (laughs) There's no one way to do it. People say, put it on your website, send it in an email, you know, send them the unwelcome letter that explains all your rules and your pricing. So they'll go away. I want to custom price everything, but every single order gets a minimum sent in their invoice. So when I send you a quote, if you're like, hey, Allison, can you do flowers for my, you know, bridal shower, baby shower, wedding, whatever it is, I'm going to give you a price based on what it is you want and set a minimum on that invoice so that you can't cancel everything except one bouquet or cancel all the centerpieces on me. And now all of a sudden my $5,000 wedding is a $2,500 wedding. So it's all about intention and, you know, tomorrow I'm doing this business plan refresh to help floors kind of like reset. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> Why right. do I have that minimum? Do Cause sometimes that happens. People go, Oh yeah, I just said I've raised my minimum, but you know what? I really love those pickups. Well then what are you doing? <laughs> if you love a pickup wedding, right? You can still have a minimum on what you charge for bouquets and boutonnieres. You know, like those things can have an internal minimum. Right. But you don't want to, you know, cut off your nose to spite your face or whatever, right? You don't want to be like, I'm trying to grow my business. And so I am leaving all this business behind. Who are your customers? Where can you meet them? And also, what are they, what are they willing to spend? And how do you elicit an easy yes from them so that they're willing to spend it. Very good. And to kind of go along with this, Leah had a question. She said, do you have to have a minimum if you're being profitable though? So like if you've done the flower math and you're being profitable, do you need a minimum then? That's a really great question. And so the answer to that would be, if you have standards for your work, you need a minimum. 
Did I lose you? No, I'm okay. here. Are you My here? computer like went to sleep for some reason. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like didn't know. It didn't know. We were You're here still here. <laughs> it was like Allison's MacBook is sleeping. Um, so um sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. Minimums if you're being profitable. Standards. Yeah. So like I can't uh, when I started my business, I might not have had like a minimum that I was putting out to people yet. I was just like, "Oh, you're willing to talk to you're willing to let me do your wedding flowers and give me money?" Yes, oh, right? Yeah. But like my bridal bouquet started at $150. That was the minimum. You know, I wouldn't necessarily have said to people, I have a minimum of $150 for bridal bouquets, but that's what it was because I really can't make you a beautiful bridal bouquet for less than that 22 years ago. You know, now the minimum is closer to like 250, 265. Some people might say 350. So, but you, for your business, for your level of work, what does it start at? Because it can't be that I call you, um, you know, and I say, hey, Leah, can you deliver me um, a $25 bouquet? And you're just like, yeah, <laughs> right? You right. got to be like, I have a $75 minimum for delivery, right? Or um, like someone inquired with me recently about a wedding. I got to reply to them. But um, are you available on a certain date? And do you have pricing and packages? Okay, so first of all, red flag. People don't usually ask me for packages. But when I reply, I will reply with a minimum based on how far away the venue is, the time of year, <clears throat> the fact that I have every other weekend that month booked. And so I'm not actually that interested right. in working that weekend as well, but I would do it if they meet a minimum. So all of those things are going to go into that minimum. So, um, yeah, I mean, if you have a per piece minimum, so, sorry, I see her, her comment there. If you, she's saying, I guess I mean a total wedding minimum, I have a per piece. So then you put it together, right? So then it's like, if somebody comes to you and says, yeah, I have a bride um, and I have, or let's just say like they have two brides. I need two bridal bouquets and I need um, 10 attendance bouquets and 15 centerpieces. Based on your per piece minimum, you now know what the minimum is for their event and you can like just that. throw that out to them. Yeah, that's great. Does and that make I, sense to answer the question? I, I feel like it does. Leah, let us know. But I have another question I feel like that feeds into that really well and I think you just answered it. So it was from Laura. Um, on YouTube, and she says, how would you handle the order was cut from, let's say, 30 centerpieces to only 20, and you have it pr already priced? I think that would help kind of protect you there, right? Exactly. So, for example, Laura, the way that would work would be, so I also have, like, they sent, I send out my quote, they have my contract, with ha which has my terms, and every time, like it's right on the invoice. So every time they look at their quote or their invoice, the minimum is right there. So they agree to it. It's really out front and center. And so then if they come to me and say, for example, like my wedding, um, one of my clients for a few weeks from now or five weeks from now, followed up to finalize. I love my customers <laughs> to, <laughs> in, to finalize early. I love you. Um, Instead of 14 centerpieces, we need 12 centerpieces. Can you add those flowers to the sweetheart table? So that's how it would work. So for example, if we're going to go from 30 centerpieces to 20, that is a drastic change. Right. Something has occurred, okay? <laughs> so then what can I do with the money from those 10 extra centerpieces? Here's the other thing, Laura. I might quote them for those 30 centerpieces, but the truth is, as long as they spend $3,000 or $2,500 or whatever it is for you, you are willing to take the order. So I sent out a quote for a wedding the other day. She was very clear with me. She had between four and $5,000. That's it. That's all we got. My quote came in between four to five thousand dollars, and I put a minimum price of four thousand dollars on the wedding. The quote was like forty six hundred dollars, but she doesn't have to spend forty six hundred. As long as she spends four thousand, 
I will be more than happy to show up and do that wedding for her. But she can't have everything she wants under the sun for $4,000. She would have to back some things out. So it's really about that client communication. And again, like knowing your intention. My intention isn't to say, well, you agreed to 30. So where are you going to put those 10 other centerpieces, right? That's not (laughs) what I'm going to do. I'm going to see how do I make this work? Or you could back out your minimum if you want to. Yeah. Set a new one. Your your business, your rules, your customer, your customer service practice, and the way you want to treat your customers. Yeah. And especially if the order is cut before you even have to place the orders, right? You know? Well, and they should be, right? Because we want to follow up with them four weeks in advance. We want to get paid at least three weeks in advance, right? So we're out of, it doesn't cost us anything. It's really though, it's that insulation that they don't drop all the centerpieces right? or all the bridesmaids bouquets. They can re- shuffle it around, reallocate it. Um, and it doesn't have to be that the minimum is the maximum that your quote came in at. You can set, hey, get me at, to get me out of bed, September wedding at a great venue, $3,000. whatever it is for you. I love it. I know we're kind of at our time. Do you have time for a couple more questions? I I always do. Okay. (laughs) Just wanted to make sure because sometimes... I never have a heart out. (laughs) Good to know. So we talked about this a little bit when we were just catching up before we started live. We were talking about kind of, you know, COVID shut everything down everyone was had weddings every day of the week every single week for a little bit there you know yeah. good couple of years i feel like and now things are starting to go back to normal so well and like new normal you know whatever that is going to be but probably like more <laughs> like what it was normal. yeah <laughs> before covid which can we even remember then i don't i don't know um so do you have any suggestions for Flores kind of dealing with this new normal? Yeah. You know, when you're doing, especially in weddings, right, we get this, okay, there's 8 million thoughts going through my mind. So first of all, if you really are struggling with dealing with this new normal, consider joining my business plan refresh tomorrow. It Literally, it's a $5 or pay whatever you want to join starting at 5 it is, it is time to recenter yourself, whether you do it with me or you do it yourself. <laughs> Why do you do this? How much money are you really trying to bring into your business? I'm giving, I'm giving away my, my starter of my uh, refresh tomorrow, because those are really two very super important questions to be answering. Because what I'm finding, I do a lot of like one-on-one coaching with uh, Floris as well. And what I'll find is people are like really downtrodden about their sales. But meanwhile, because they're really trying to beat a goal that was, like you just said, for whatever reason, COVID gave a boost to so many florists, not everybody, but a lot, right? Right. And they're, they're trying to beat that boost. And it's like, they're super down about themselves and their business because they're trying to beat something that it, I don't want to say it can't be beat, right? Because you could do whatever you want, right? But if you try hard enough, work hard enough, have a, have a plan, right? That's overworking and just trying and trying the pivot, right? Mm-hmm. I want to get out of pivot and into flow. When we're pushing so hard, it is hard to get into a natural rhythm and we're chasing things that maybe don't even matter. Like, increasing a sales goal when meanwhile we have enough money in the bank we don't actually we haven't even paid ourselves the money's just sitting in the bank (laughs) and right like we're not even paying attention we are just kind of in it and so then we go oh but i last year i booked so early the year before that i booked even earlier and this year all these inquiries are slow right Mm -hmm. so it is easy for me to just throw out like a sound bite and say, keep the faith. We've been here before. We've had recessions before. I had a business through the recession, right? 
right. <laughs> through right. the housing crisis. I my business only grew since then, right? Like that's easy for me to say, but it didn't happen because I lacked a plan. It didn't happen, and I had poor planning. <laughs> I grow my business because I really focus on what am I trying to accomplish? Why am I doing this? Also, how much money do I want to make? And then what do I need to do to really align my actions with the outcome I want? Because that's what too many people are still doing. I want to book more weddings. And they're posting on Instagram instead of actually making a connection with a wedding planner at an event or following up with a venue and or even just commenting on someone else's Instagram post instead of just trying to get attention for themselves. If you feel like I'm talking to you personally, I'm not. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) This is not a personal attack. This is the like sort of bad habit, right? This is why we want to stop pivot refresh so we can get into this flow of where are we really going? Because when we're trying to like, what's the latest soundbite on TikTok and how do I create content around that? In, and why am I not booking a client for weddings? Sorry, I feel like I'm yelling. I'm going to take a breath. But when that's what's happening, instead of revisiting a business plan, getting in touch with your, like why you're doing this and what you actually want to do so you can go, oh, you know what? I do love those pickups. I am actually going to post on Instagram about that I'm doing pickups because then I might actually attract that to myself Mm versus I want to get that sound bite. Like what kind of Barbie am I? Right. Right. And just fitting in with the trend. Like earlier, the first session, the question was asked about trends, right? Right. We, everything that people are doing is a trend right now and they don't even realize it, right? They think they're doing what they're supposed to do. Oh, everyone's doing this, so I'm doing that. That's not how it used to be, right? It used to be we all want to do something different to right. be distinct. And so if you find yourself following other people right now and wondering why you're not booking, but you're not focused on where is your ideal customer? Who is already in touch with them? And how do you get them to put that client in touch with you? It really, you have to go back to basics, real people. That's, if there's any kind of pre-COVID normal, it's real people and real relationships are going to be at the heart of what keeps moving your business forward. Amen to that. And I didn't feel like you were yelling. You were just very passionate. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) No, that was great. Um, I do have one more question. Yeah. Came in on Instagram from Flora. Flora Adora Studio. That's a cute name. I like that. That is adorable. It's an adorable name. Um, they asked, do you itemize your quotes showing price, quantity, tax, et cetera? I do. You don't have to. There isn't one right way to run your business. This is why when we zoom out and we get in touch with who, again, why we're doing this, like who we serve, we can create systems that make the most sense and support what we're trying to do, which is you know, attract the right customers, repel the wrong customers, and set ourselves up as the authority so that people have an easy time following us. So like when I say, when I talk to a client and I say, um, so they say, so what do we do from here? And I say, well, I'm going to send you a quote. It'll be itemized so you can see how everything breaks down. Um, you know, from there, if you, if you decide you want to move forward, there's a contract and deposit. And then we work at your pace. You know, I just explain to them how it works. That transparency piece is a huge part of my brand. Um, some people made some nice comments here. Thank you very much for following me and working with me. If you followed me or worked with me before, that like integrity piece and intention piece is huge, right? I want to have a brand that people rave about, that people trust, right? Whether it's you bought your, you got your wedding flowers from me and I like read your mind and 
created something, <laughs> you know, more beautiful than you ever imagined, right? Which is what you guys are doing too. I don't know. <laughs> I know you get reviews like that too. I'm not special. Um, but, or it's like, oh, flower math, let me, allowed me to quit my job, right? <laughs> That's right. my favorite one. I quit my job and do flowers full time. That's like, it comes down to how do you make sure that the customer at the end of the day feels that trust and like they got what they expected. For me, transparency is a huge piece of that. That's why I itemize. There are times where I have not itemized because I like to experiment. That didn't feel as genuine to me, but it did not impact my bookings at all people still booked. So if you don't want to itemize because some people insist that it creates pushback, I don't get pushback, but if that's what you're worried about, I would still itemize for myself. So I see how all the pieces come together, but then I would just present the customer with the price. This would be the price for your event. This would be the price with the tax. This is, you know, the booking steps if you want to move forward. I had no problem booking that way. And it just didn't work for me. <laughs> it just, I didn't like it. But the reason why it works and why you can experiment if you want to is because at the end of the day, either they have it or they had it. Okay. I have to resist from singing gypsy. Some people got it and they get paid. <laughs> So, right, like either you got it or you don't. Either you've got the $3,000 for flowers or you don't. It doesn't matter how it breaks down. Right, right. <laughs> so that's for me. It's my brand is breaking it down. For you, it doesn't have to be. Very that was good. kind of a long answer to a short question. but I like it. I like it. And then um, let's see. Fran was asking about the workshop that you mentioned in September. So I'm going to share the link again with everyone for the floral education page on your website. But do you want to talk about that real quick? Yes. So I'm going to be doing in September, my fall pricing chat. It's a one hour chat. We talk about the three most important numbers that florists need to know. It's more of a webinar. Like I take you through the numbers and we talk about your profit margin and calculating it and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that kicks off my flower math fall sale. That is a three-day sale. You, the link that Yvonne just shared, when you go there, I tried to make it simple because you know this. It's like, how do you promote multiple things at once? I'm doing right. this. I'm doing that. I want to just, I'm doing a bunch of stuff. <laughs> You're going to find all the stuff there. The only things you can sign up for right now are the business plan refresh tomorrow and then the pricing chat, which is totally free, because um, I really think this is just stuff people need to know. So I don't charge people have I've had some business advisors who are like, you should be charging for that pricing chat. I'm like, no, that's again, like when we know what's aligned, I think every florist should make money in their business and it shouldn't there shouldn't be gatekeeping around like <laughs> how you do that. Right. I do share it in my course so that you can see like how, how I do it and how I make real money on real weddings. But I don't think this kind of stuff should be a secret. So there's a link to just, you'll get on an email list and I'll send you that Zoom link and you'll be able to get in on that chat as well. So, and that's totally free. Awesome. Well, that's a wrap, I believe. I shared the link. Someone just, sorry, someone asked for a link. I shared the link, guys. Um, oh, and so Diana says she signed up for tomorrow. Thank you. I hope you will enjoy it. I'm really looking forward to it. I love talking about refreshing your business. Even though I love talking, I could talk pricing all day. Um, talking about how you get excited about your business is, I feel like, really needed right now because there's nobody who's going to be more excited about your business than you. Right. And so if you're feeling less than excited about your business and then you're like, why am I not getting inquiries? Why is everything feeling like I'm working and to no avail? Look inward, you know, we got to get, we got to get super excited about our business, which is hard to do, but I'm here to rock. <laughs> <laughs> because it is I exciting. love it. It is exciting Thank to you. have your own business. Awesome. You're amazing, Allison. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending an hour with us. That's Anytime. Amazing. It is my absolute pleasure. I really was so um, 
really excited when you asked me to come on because like, okay, and here's my, here's my woo-woo-ness, right? But like I had written down on the calendar to go live today, but I had nothing planned. And then like the next day you said, Hey, can you come live with me on this day? And I was like, yeah, I think I scheduled that yesterday, you know? <laughs> yes. it, was, it was meant to be. It was. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I know that sounds a little woo woo, but it really did. It was like, yes. All right. <laughs> made that happen all i did i love put it on my calendar i love it i love the woo woo you can woo woo all the all you want with me cool we need it we need a little to get by a little dash exactly exactly so thank you allison again thank you guys for everyone that like has spent the day with me or even if you spent like two minutes with me i don't care i appreciate it all um i hope that you guys were able to catch you know obviously allison's segment that we're doing right now gilberto david diana um but if not no worries because of course the recap will be up on our blog within the next few days. You got to give me a little bit of time. Um, and then if you want to get notified as soon as it's up, you just got to subscribe to our email y'all, you know, and then you will get all the Mayish news and updates and all the fun stuff. So again, I so greatly appreciate your time and support guys. Uh, if you have any questions in the meantime, you know, you know me, I'm going to be back live. I have another one planned with, uh, Kristen Vanderyat, he has a new book, you guys. So he's going to be on next month to talk with that. And I have to chat with our new Mayish Design Star. We always have things to talk about. So I will be back. And again, I hope to see you soon. Thank you again, Allison. I love you. I'll talk to you guys later. Have a good My day. Pleasure. Thanks, Yvonne. And congrats on doing this whole day. Well done, you. Yay! Well done. <laughs> Woohoo! And I have my two Stanleys. I, I made it with all my water and all the fun stuff. I had snacks well done. and you thanks, know, the whole thanks thing. Thanks for creating this environment for all of us to enjoy. So thank of you. Of course, for your hard of work. course. I love having fun with you guys. So this was this was awesome. So take care, and I'll see y'all soon.